Okay, um, Paul Chak, holistic health practitioner, is a prominent expert in the field of holistic health, corrective exercise, and high performance conditioning. For over 22 years, Paul's unique integrative approach to treatment and education has changed the lives of countless clients, students, and peers. By treating the body as a whole system and finding the root cause of a problem, Paul coaches clients towards complete resolution of their health and performance challenges, where traditional approaches have consistently failed. He is the founder of the Czech Institute, which stands for Corrective Holistic Exercise Kinesiology, and the creator of PPS, which stands for Success Mastery Program. He has produced over 50 DVDs, 17 advanced level home study courses, and is the author of five books, including How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy, which we do carry here at the Foundation. Fabulous book. We've carried it for a long time. It's wonderful. Paul has won several accolades for his presenting, including the best male presenter from ECA World Fitness and a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Society of Weight Training Specialists. He has consulted internationally for organizations such as Chicago Bulls, Australia's Canberra Raiders, and New Zealand's Auckland Blues. Please join me in welcoming Paul Check. I could have just said, it doesn't matter. I'll tell you a story, and if it sounds right, it is. If it's not, then it doesn't matter, does it? All that stuff is fluffy stuff. All right, well, it's nice to be here at the uh, Price Pottinger Foundation. I uh, very much believe in the principles of Weston A. Price and Francis Marion Pottinger. And uh, I don't believe in them because I have nothing else to do. I believe in them because it works. And uh, I've actually been in clinical practice for 24 years. And what I've found consistently through my professional practice is that, well, the medical system just gets more and more technical, I actually have to get more and more simple. And most of my patients are people that have spent huge amounts of money, sometimes half a million dollars, trying to get over a disease or a number of diseases or have had 20 years of serious back pain or neck pain and they come to me with files that you know oftentimes take me a week literally a week to read through because there's just so many tests in there so much data so I look at all the data and all the data does is reinforce wow this person's got a lot of problems but anybody could seen that the, the question is what are we going to do about it Right? So I get all these people coming from around the world with all this information and part of the problem is, is that many times, frequently, actually most of the time, the information they get from the doctors conflicts. So one doctor says you have chronic fatigue syndrome, the next doctor says you have irritable bowel syndrome, the next doctor says it's all in your head, the next doctor says it's genetic, get over it, and the next doctor says well you're 45, what do you expect? Right? So there's really, there's really uh, nothing they can grasp onto, nothing to help people move forward. Now, uh, my background, be my career began working with elite athletes. I was the trainer of the United States Army boxing team. And I spent two years working with an osteopathic physician who was the team doctor. So I learned from the very beginning of my career how to take care of sports injuries from an osteopath. And I did the massage therapy for the fighters and my job was to design all their nutrition programs. And um, I got on the Army boxing team by boxing my way onto the team. So my whole background really began in high performance athletics. In high performance athletics, nobody really cares how you do it, just that you do do it. Right? So we don't really care what you do to win. On a boxing team, we, we used to say there's only two judges, you better bring them if you want to win K and O. Because all the fluffy stuff never really matters. Nobody remembers who got a silver medal in the Olympics, do they? Right? Unless it was you. <laughs> and so the reason I preface with this statement is that we've got a medical system that seems to have lots of great ideas. But there's no consistency in the etiology. What caused the individual's problems? What I found over and over again 
from years and years and years of working with patients is that I could track the etiology back to just a few things. And it's sort of a paradox. Many of my students come and spend as much as five and a half years training with me and I give them very big manuals. The Holistic Lifestyle Coach Level 2 manual weighs 8.8 .8 pounds. It's a great doorstop. It's a great paperweight. If you want to test the suspension in your car, throw a few in the back. But at the end of the training, after a year and a half of holistic lifestyle coaching, I say, okay, now, what do you really know? Right? What do you know for sure? And that's what it always boils down to. And my program's multidisciplinary. I've got medical doctors in there. I've got chiropractors in there. I've got osteopaths. I've got nutritionists. I've got podiatrists. I've got everything you can think of in my training program. And at the end of the day, it always boils down to, and I say this to the, uh, to the practitioners to make a point, what do you know for sure when it comes to health? What do you know works every time? What do you know for sure if it's missing in somebody's life is going to cause stress and eventually lead to a disease? So we'll get to the what do you know for sure stuff. Because we already know that a bunch of wise guys with lots of data isn't getting us healthy, is it? We already know that just because we can fly Boeing 777s and space shuttles, it doesn't have anything to do with our level of intelligence and health. We already know that MRIs, CAT scans, PET scans, and fancy technology doesn't do anything but tell us that we're screwed up. So what? Okay. The question is, what can we do for ourselves? That's what I'm here to talk about tonight. It's actually been 24 years now, so the slide's a little old. I've found that the foundation principles, if adhered to, 80% of the time, will give you a lifetime that is most likely to be free of disease, barring genetic influences, which are very, very uncommon to be the cause of disease. You see now that people are, the medical system starting to lean on the, gen the, the genetics as a source of your pathology. In other words, you have the fat gene. Right. Okay, good. If you have the fat gene, you better also develop the exercise gene and the nutrition gene. <laughs> or the fat gene will be the only one at the bus stop. Okay. The, so what we see now is people can buy an excuse to be sick. They can buy an excuse to be overweight. They can go to the doctor and get told, oh, no wonder you've got this problem. Okay. But the reality of it is, if you live within a few principles 80% of the time, then your genetic weaknesses never really get to show their ugly head. The chain is only as strong as the weakest link, yet a well-maintained chain with a weak link is a lot less likely to break than a rusty old beat-up chain that nobody takes care of that has a weak link. So we all have weak links. Every one of us has weak links. We all have cancer cells in our body all the time. We're all breathing in funguses constantly. We're eating and drinking bacteria constantly. There's lots of little creatures that are standing there anxious to eat us. Because as far as they're concerned, we're more tasty than anything else they're getting. I mean, think about it. They're on the ground. Once they get on you, at least you're warm and you got a heartbeat. That's fresh stuff. So you got to make sure that you're healthy enough that they don't want to do their job and put you back in the soil. So what are the foundation principles? Well, there's just a few foundation principles. I use the ancient philosophy of Hippocrates. Hippocrates believed there was really only three things that almost all diseases came from. So Hippocrates spoke of Dr. Quiet, Dr. Diet, and Dr. Happiness. So when Hippocrates was a physician, he found that almost all the people that saw him with any kind of an ailment were suffering from a lack of quiet time, either or they were eating incorrectly, or they were unhappy. Now, these are very critical things. If you're not eating right, it's the equivalent of putting the wrong kind of fuel in your car. How long does it take for you to notice there's something wrong if you put the wrong kind of fuel in your car? Try putting diesel in a gasoline-powered car and you won't get very far at all. Once the fuel that's in the carburetor is gone, the engine will stop. If you put 
gasoline in a diesel engine, it'll burn a hole in the piston, the engine will probably blow up. So these are really uh, extremely basic things. Very basic. And as I'll show you, they're very, very overlooked. The reason they're so overlooked is because nobody makes money by telling you to go to bed on time. Hardly anybody makes any money by saying, well, listen, you need to quit eating so much carbohydrate or you're eating too much meat for your genetic needs or your racial and ethnic needs. N nobody makes any money by saying, why don't you spend some time trying to figure out what really makes you happy so you know when it's happening. Uh, I've been in this business for 24 years and I can count the patients on one hand that when I ask them what makes them happy could give me a clear definition without actually sitting there and having to do a whole bunch of mental gymnastics to kind of come to some sort of a conclusion. And the reality of it is, if you don't know what makes you happy, how do you know if you have it or not? Right? So the United States is a place where we're in a perpetual search for this elusive happiness. And if you don't know what it is, how do you know when you find it? So it's kind of like a fish looking for water. Right? We're like the fish that drowned. <laughs> we, we drowned in our health. So, we also have another issue. I had to come along behind Hippocrates and give him a little support. That's doctor movement. Today we have a tremendous amount of disease from a sedentary lifestyle. So I added a new doctor. Hippocrates didn't have to worry about that. Back in his day, even doing the laundry would have been a, a quite a good workout. I don't know if you, any of you remember the days of doing laundry on a scrub board. My grandmother used to do laundry on a scrub board. You know, we had seven people in our family, so when you're doing you know, laundry for seven people on a scrub board, you, you know, the, the concept of a gym is kind of like uh, redundant. But today we don't have this issue. Today we've got automation for our automation. You know, you, you, everything's got a remote control on it. Practically thinks for itself. Breathing is also important, and breathing is linked to thinking. Dr. Happiness is really how you think. Your happiness is frequently your state of mental self-management and emotional self-management, and breathing is actually a mirror of these other doctors. But if you don't breathe right, then your pH balance is off, your physiology is off. Also, the way you breathe has a huge influence on the balance of your autonomic nervous system. For example, as I'll show you, Today we have a tremendous problem with craniofacial growth and development disorders due to malnutrition. So when people's craniofacial structures don't grow right, the first thing that happens is they can't breathe right. So the instant they start breathing incorrectly, it switches you into a sympathetic dominance, which means your body thinks you're under stress all the time. So we've got kids being born today who are perpetually in a fight or flight state. This is one of the reasons they're so addicted to these combat games and killer this and killer that and destruction this, destruction that because they're constantly being kept in a state of fight or flight behavior. So these are people that grow up and they never really know how to get calm. They never really know how to hold still. The concept of meditation is very, very foreign to people like that because people that can't breathe right have a very hard time calming their mind down because the breathing and the mind mirror each other. So these are some very, very simple principles, but the reality of it is you can spend your life studying any one of these. You study Dr. Happiness for the rest of your life, we call you a psychologist. You study breathing for the rest of your life, we call you a yogi. You study movement for the rest of your life, you're a Czech practitioner maybe, or a personal trainer, or a dance educator. You study diet for the rest of your life, you're supposed to be a nutritionist, but have you ever gone to a nutrition conference? Right? You can't really tell whether it's a conference for water buffaloes or educated people. Because when I go to nutrition conferences, I see the sickest people in the country. So we need to reevaluate the word nutrition. And then Dr. Quiet, if you study how much time a person needs to themselves, well, that could be a psychologist, it could be a yogi, and that could be somebody who's just learn to be honest with their needs. So, it's very important to remember that we all exchange energy. It's just a rule of the universe. The universe is, is designed on what's sometimes referred to as the love principle. 
um, without getting into a bunch of heavy metaphysics. The love principle essentially states that we all must give and we all must receive. So we're always giving and we're always receiving whether we want to, whether we want to admit it or not. So, for example, all of us has a certain level of happiness, a certain level of vitality, a certain level of well-being. The happier and healthier you are, the more energy you have. The more energy you have, the more energy you radiate. Just like the more energy you put through a light bulb, the more light it radiates. Okay? The sun is bright because it has a lot of energy. The moon isn't very bright because it doesn't have a thermonuclear power source in it like the sun does. So what you'll see is that when someone's healthy and vital, they carry a large energetic charge which it shows up in what you know of as their aura. Okay? And good scientific research shows that whenever you get into another person's auric field, whichever one of the two people is strongest bleeds energy off to the two, to the one that's the weakest. So the overall level of vitality of each of you determines whether or not you're drawing energy from someone next to you or giving energy to them. And this is not something that you can easily stop. It would be kind of like taking two bar magnets and sitting them next to each other, putting one north pole next to the next south pole, and saying, now you two stop sharing energy here. It ain't going to happen. And really that's what we are. We're biological magnets. We're all, the whole body's built like biomagnets. The whole body is polarized. Every living cell in the entire world is polarized. Okay? So what does this mean? It means I'm talking predominantly to healthcare professionals. So this lecture is a lecture I give mostly to healthcare professionals and I say, well, which one are you? If you're a healthcare professional or an exercise professional or a nutritionist or anything to do with health at all, it's probably ideal if you're the one that has the most energy because that's an example of your own life. To the degree that you have energy and you can share energy, then you're living congruent with the principles of nature. Certainly you've been around people that are fun to be around. Usually people that are fun to be around, they don't drain you. And you've all had the experience of being drained by people. You say, oh, nice person, but really draining. Right? What that means is they said all the right words, but when you left them, you felt like you were energetically plucked. Right? It's tiring. And that's what, what love is. You see, you've been loving people like that. So our goal here is to achieve a level of vitality so that we can be in society, we can be school teachers, we can be doctors, we can be therapists, we can be lawyers, we can be dentists. We can be whatever we want to be and not get to the point where we feel like we got to have a cup of coffee just to survive the day or go home at night and crash and become antisocial when we're supposed to be going home to share ourselves with our family. But instead most people go home and they just want to sit down, look at the television and go dead because they're drained. Now, most of my patients look just like that. That's a classic patient for a Czech practitioner. That's actually one of my patients. At the end of the lecture, I'll show you what she looked like after one year on the program in my book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy, except she got the summarized version. Quick story. Um, this lady's from New Zealand. She's an ex-power lifter. And... Um, I'd walked into the gym where I train in New Zealand when I'm there, and I'm there quite a bit. I've done probably about 120 lectures in New Zealand. And uh, I noticed this girl lifting weights in the gym, and she was lifting big weights. I mean, she was doing bent over rows with about 165 pounds, and uh, squatting, I think, if I remember right, two and a quarter. So she's a very strong girl, and she's about five foot four, and I think she weighs about 225, 230 pounds right there. So she's not a little woman, but she was by no means um, f flabby. You know, she's like a farm girl, but she was carrying a lot of weight. So I just watch, you know, I see these things I'm everywhere I go that's all around me. And I just thought, there's a girl that just needs to be taught how to eat. That's all that's wrong with this woman. She's fit, but she doesn't know how to eat. I can tell just by looking at her body. And when you're in the business as long as I've been in, I can look at anybody in the room and start telling you things that are probably wrong in your diet or your lifestyle because that's what I do all day. 
the same way a you know a mechanic can open the hood of your car and listen to your engine and say well you're missing on the eighth cylinder and you got a crack plug wire and your distributor cap needs to be cleaned I look at people and do the same thing it's not a big deal it's just what I do well I looked at her and I thought well this girl just needs a proper diet she needs to be metabolically type and she needs to get the grain and the dairy out of her diet and clean up because she's probably got intolerances well lo and behold I booked a massage and the next day I'm laying on the massage table and she walks in. I thought, well, isn't this funny? Right? So I just kind of warmed up to her a little bit before I dropped a little Paul Check bomb on her. <laughs> I said, <laughs> her name's Sharon. And I said, you know, Sharon, you're a lovely woman and I was watching you train in the gym. It's very evident that you're strong. You must have a background in weightlifting or powerlifting or something. She said, yeah, I used to be a competitive powerlifter. I said, well, forgive me for asking, but are you having a hard time dropping weight? Because the way you train, you train like a professional athlete. And it's not likely, it's not normal to see a woman who lifts weights like that carrying so much body weight. Are you having some kind of uh, challenge losing weight? And she just broke down in tears, you know, so there went my massage. <laughs> Which is cool, right? Remember the love principle? I had to share. She ended up finishing the massage, but... So she started crying. She says, you know, Paul, she says, I've been seeing doctors for years. I've been gaining weight progressively every year for the last several years. And every time I go to the doctor, they always give me a different diagnosis than the previous doctor. She says, I'm just so frustrated. I don't know what to do anymore. She said, it's even worse. When I go to the doctor, they start telling me that the doctor that I saw was an idiot. So she says, I don't know who to trust anymore. So she says, I've gotten so stressed over this thing, I just give up. So she says, all I do is I just come and lift weights as hard as I can and hope that I'll lose some weight but she says I don't know what's wrong with me I keep getting bigger not smaller and I said well it's probably your diet she said yeah but I eat really good and I said do you how much bread do you eat how much cereal do you eat how much dairy are you eating right so I went down the list and sure enough she was eating you know very much like dietitians write that you should eat in a diet book she was eating like the food pyramid I said well, you know there's a reason they call that the feedlot pyramid she says, what do you mean? I said, that's exactly how you feed cattle to make them fat. And when they sell cattle, they don't do body fat checks on them. They sell them by the pound. And as I'll show you later, there's a reason they feed cattle the way they feed them. So I said, I'll make you a deal. I will write you a program after I get off this massage table under one condition. If you don't follow it, you have to pay me my minimum fee for writing a program, which is 1,000 New Zealand dollars. I charge 500 US dollars an hour, and at that time the ratio was two New Zealand dollars for one American dollar. So I said, you will owe me $1,000 if I show up in New Zealand a year from now to do my next lecture series and you have not followed the program. If you can agree on that, I'll write you a program. So she said, absolutely, I'll do it. I said, there's only one other qualifier. There's a lady in the gym here that I've trained she can write you your exercise program because you're overtraining. You're working too hard. You're burning yourself out. Your, your, your motivation is good, but the intention's actually getting the wrong results. You see, when someone trains too much, it overloads their body with stress hormones, so it has the opposite effect. The body actually thinks it's dying, so you start gaining weight and holding water. Because whenever the body's physically overloaded, it wants to prepare itself for the worst. So think about it. If you were going off into a battlefield, you'd want to carry some water with you, wouldn't you? And you'd want to carry food with you too, wouldn't you? You wouldn't just run off into the middle of a battlefield with no water and no food, because all they'd have to do is just starve you out. Okay? So whenever you overwork the body, it starts carrying water, and it starts carrying energy as fat. So typically, you'll actually see a lot of people that overwork with their exercise programs gaining weight depending on the type of exercise they're doing. So she was happy to agree to that. I'll show you what she looked like one year later when I came in the gym. And it was so shocking. I said to her, what happened? And she started laughing. She said, what do you mean what happened? You wrote the program. I said, well, to be honest with you, you're the first person I've ever written a program without charging them that followed it. That's why I charge a lot. Because I want, I want to make sure you're interested. <laughs> I learned the hard way. You get what you pay for, and people don't invest, they don't take you seriously. This is a uh, questionnaire that I use with my patients 
and it covers 29 organ and glandular systems and it gives me a readout to show me where your physiology and your uh, psychology is under stress. I teach my students how to do a metaphysical reading on this because each of the biological systems is connected with a psychic center in Eastern philosophy they're called chakras so depending on where your body has problems I know what kind of questions to begin asking you about your emotional and mental health so typically the patients that check practitioners see are adrenally fatigued hormonally imbalanced can't sleep well often depressed dehydrated constipated frequently toxic almost always they have digestive trouble frequently hypothyroid she was hypothyroid they're frequently taking bags of pills and very frequently they're tired of doctors and the it's a challenge for me because I I'm a multidisciplinary practitioner. So when people come to me, I'm not interested in trying to do everything myself. Totally the opposite. I farm out a lot of the work to the best people. So if you need an endocrinologist, I'll send you to the best one I know. If you need a gynecologist, I'll send you to the best one I know. So I'm like an air traffic controller. People that come to see me come from all over the world with lots of chronic problems and acute problems and diseases that they've had and they can't get rid of. And what I do is I write a battle plan. I write a plan of execution. So they say, tell me how much money you got, tell me how much time you've got, give me a, give me a reading on your willingness meter. Who sent you here? Was it your husband? or your wife or your parents or your boss because if they sent you here I know you're not motivated if you sent yourself here good the willingness meter is going to be high so I write a plan and oftentimes that plan includes other doctors and very frequently I end up having to spend a lot of time selling my patients on the doctors and I say listen I'm recommending the doctor to you so I'll make you a deal if the doctor's no good I'll pay the bill so far I haven't had to pay any bills but I have to have that conversation a lot it's very sad for me as a holistic health practitioner to see our country in the state that it's in and to see as much medical drugs being consumed and to see medical doctors allowing themselves to become prostitutes for drug corporations and they know it because you cannot evaluate people all day long you can't be looking in people's no noses mouths ears and orifices and see all the problems people have day in and day out and realize given the drugs not changing a damn thing so we we have an illness in the medical industry but we can't wait for it to cure itself we have to manage ourselves so we so we don't have to become part of their little system okay so now, health is a matter of balance. So if you think of life like a three-legged stool, in order for you to experience life in a state of happiness or well-being, it's very, very important that you realize that doctor movement, doctor diet, and doctor quiet, which is the chief physician in charge of your emotional, mental, and spiritual well-being, they all have to be balanced, and they all have to be stable, and they all have to be present, or the stool is going to fall over. And if you fall off a bar stool, you're probably uh, going to put a dent in your happiness. Now, in my book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy, I took this concept, which is very important because it gives me an individualized readout. This is what's called a functional health assessment. Most people wait till they're in pain to go to a hospital or to go to a doctor to get diagnostic tests run. They wait till something's really wrong. What this allows me to do is to identify the symptoms of a functional pathology. So what are some of the indicators, for example, that your adrenal glands are exhausted that I can identify and I don't have to wait till you've got Adson's disease to say, well, geez, you burnt your adrenal glands out. Congratulations. Now you're going to have to be on hormonal supplements for the rest of your life. We don't want people waiting till they're a type 2 diabetic to find out that they didn't know how to manage blood sugar. That's backwards, right? So what I did in my book is I actually designed the book. So I put together a series of questionnaires that identify what's the quality of the food you're eating? How much stress do you have in your life? How are you doing with your sleep-wake cycles? Um, how frequently are you eating or are you skipping meals? How is your digestion? How toxic are you? And what's the total stress in your physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual well-being? 
You see, what most people don't realize is the body summates stress. So your body doesn't differentiate between going through a divorce, exercising incorrectly, and having financial trouble and having a bacterial dysbiosis. It adds those things all up. And your total stress picture is the sum of all stress inputs in your life. So before I can write an exercise program for anybody or prescribe any kind of an exercise program or even write a book with exercises in it, I have to have a way to help you, the individual, identify what your total stress levels are. If you don't know your total stress level, I don't know any way that I can safely prescribe an exercise for you. Because there's two kinds of exercises. Work out exercises, and that's what most people that are trying to change their body shape are doing. They think they got to work out. The word work out literally means, work means to expend energy, and out means out there. So when you go to the gym to work out, you take your vital resources, convert it to energy, and spend it by moving objects. Now on the farm, I used to dig fence post holes, mend fences, clean barns, move hay bales. That was my dad's idea of a workout, okay? So at the end of the day, if you had enough energy to lift weights, you better not tell anybody, okay? <laughs> Keep that a secret. Because if you have enough energy to lift weights on my dad's farm, it means you aren't working hard enough, right? But the reality of it is, today, most people that are going to work out don't have enough energy to even run their biological systems. Their bodies are collapsing. So the other kind of exercise is working in. So in my book, you'll see up here, I've got zones. Zone one, two, and three. Zone four. Zone three. One, two, three. Three and four. Those zones all correlate to different biological systems. And depending on how you score, I determine whether you need to be working in, doing exercises that accumulate more energy by doing them than they spend. So if you do Tai Chi correctly, you should finish with more energy than when you started. If you do yoga correctly, you should finish with more energy than when you started. If you do Qigong correctly, you should finish with more energy than when you started. You should leave the session with a surplus. If you go to the gym and work out, you will never have more energy than when you started. Otherwise, you're not working out. You're just making friends in the gym, okay? You're not working out. So your total score determines the type of exercise program you get. And my book has exercise programs for four different levels of vitality. So the more stressed you are, the easier the program. And it gets so easy, you got Paul Check's no workout workout. And that's as easy as you can get, okay? No workout. The no workout workout is you park your car at the end of the parking lot and you walk. You don't use escalators and elevators, you take the stairs. And if that's all I can get you to do while you're rounding up good food, that's probably enough for you. Because for some people that's a lot of exercise. I'll never forget when my institute was in Encinitas, I was working with a client and I heard this huffing and puffing and moaning. and Strangely enough, above us was a place that sold uh, porno videos. And there was, you had to go up a set of stairs to get to this porno video office. And I heard all this huffing and puffing and it sounded way too live to be a video. So I thought, what in the world is going on? Maybe they're shooting a porno video on the stairs outside my gym here. So I walked out the door and looked, and there was this lady who was very obese. She had just rented some porno videos, and she got so tired walking down one flight of stairs, she had to sit down, and she, I thought she was going to have a heart attack. She was exhausted, she was sweating, and she'd only made it down six steps. It took her, she had to do one flight of stairs in three sets. Okay, so this is what I'm talking about. This is the kind of person that does not need and should not have a workout program because it'll kill them. Okay, but a lot of people don't understand these basic principles. I also designed that so that it's very, very simple because most of you people that read this book, even as healthy as some of you are, you'd probably score high, a lot of you, in at least three of those columns. And a lot of people get overwhelmed. They go, oh my God. 
what am I going to do? I actually designed the books. So you don't even have to read the book. You just read the chapters that you score high in. And I designed the questionnaire so you start from the left. So if you score high on every one of them, the first thing you do is you get your food quality up. That's first thing, priority number one. Don't worry about any of that stuff because everything to the left is almost always a symptom of the furthest column on the right. So once you start eating high quality, free range and organic foods, three months later, half of these problems are gone, sometimes all of them. Right? So, but what do people do? They go to the doctor, they get all these tests run, and they find out that they're screwed up, they're going to die, they got this, they got that, and then what? Take more drugs? That's more stress. Drugs are stressful to the body, period. Drugs aren't food. Sick people can't handle drugs. That's a bit of a paradox, isn't it? So I designed the system so it's very easy to follow. And if you're too tired to read the chapter, now a lot of my patients are. I've had patients call me on the phone after they got my paperwork and they say, you know what, I can't even fill this paperwork out. I just don't have the concentration to do this. People are on the phone crying, saying, I can't fill this paperwork out. It's just, it'll take me a month to fill this paperwork out. So, fine. In my book, you can read the mind map. I put a mind map, an artistic rendering of what's in the chapter. So you can just look at the pictures. And it's all on one page. You can read my whole book in one hour just by... So if you can read a comic book, you can read that book. And what I'm going to tell you tonight is nothing you don't know. Isn't that stupid? I'm going to get you all together here, and I'm going to tell you everything you already know. And you're going to walk out of here and say, why the hell did I go to that lecture? I already knew that. And then I'm going to ask you, did you really know that? Look in the toilet at your poops. And if they're good looking, you know how to poop. But if they stink and they sink, you don't know how to poop. And guess what? You can't know how to poop till you know how to eat. Because the way you poop is linked to the way you eat. And you can't poop right until you know how to rest right. Because if you're not resting right, you can't poop right. And if you're not happy, you never poop right. Right? You can always tell who's happy because they look in the toilet. <laughs> People that aren't happy don't want to look in the toilet because their life already stinks, so they don't want to look at it anymore. <laughs> right? So people always, my patients sit down and tell me, I know that, I know that. I go, do you? What are you doing here then? Maybe we ought to go out and have a nice shit together <laughs> and we'll see which one of us is healthy. Right? I've heard, I already know that, 87 million times. <laughs> People that know that are never in my office. <laughs> unless they're there to give me a massage. Right, Rhonda? <laughs> so billions and billions of dollars of cancer research, and what do we have? In the year 1900, the risk of cancer was 1 in 30. So one person in 30 would get cancer in the year 1900. By the year 1980, it was 1 in 5. That's pretty shocking. Okay, Only 80 years and we went from 1 in 30 to 1 in 5. By 1990, it was 1 in 4. By 1995, it was 1 in 3. And today, it's worse than 1 in 2. That means scientific evidence says that 50% of the people in this room right now statistically will die of cancer. Look around. Half of you are going to die of cancer. Now, what does that say about our medical success? What does that say about our billions and billions of dollars of cancer research? That doesn't say a lot to me. Well, the reality of it doesn't have to be that way. Even in today's society, there's a lot of things you can do to protect yourself against any disease. We spend $14 million a minute on health care in the United States, more than any country in the world, but we rank between 19th and 37th in almost every category. We are the sickest of the industrial nations in the world. This is not good. Okay? When you have the most advanced weapons and the most advanced transportation systems and the sickest people running them, that should be concerning to you. <laughs> I don't know if any of you ever saw this uh, New York Times October the 18th 2005 heart disease epidemic linked to red meat consumption and alliance. Any of you see that report? No? 
Any of you see this one escalating breast cancer epidemic among female chimpanzees? No? None of you saw that. There's a reason you never saw that. <laughs> because <laughs> it isn't going to happen. It's bullshit. I made it up. <laughs> to make a point. Right? The point is, carnivorous animals like lions have been eating red meat since the beginning of time. And as far as I can tell, none of them ever had a heart attack. And isn't it funny that people say, oh, you can't compare yourself to a lion. You can't compare a human being to animals. Oh, have you studied any medical physiology texts or any medical textbooks at all? Almost every single thing we do with human beings is based on animal studies. And there's many similarities. There's differences, but there's many similarities. So the reality of it is, biologically, we are animals. Our bodies are animal bodies. Spiritually, we're human beings, but biologically, we're animals. So we fall under the same rules and regulations as an animal when it comes to these basic principles. You don't see giraffes watching late night television. You don't see them, you know, worried about whether or not the guy next door is driving a fancier car. They don't get caught in all this stuff. You don't see them reading diet books. When my researchers checked for me when I was writing the book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy, I, I wanted to know how many books are there on diet in the United States available. 4,369 books on diet alone available in the United States. Well, that's interesting. 4,369 books on diet. I've never seen a fat lion and they don't read any books on diet. I've never seen a fat alligator. No books on diet. I've never seen an animal in its natural environment that had any of the kind of problems that we do and none of them even know how to read. So it seems to me that the more about diet you read, the more trouble you get into. Okay? These animals, like we used to do, are living based on what's called a closed organic cycle. The closed organic cycle basically says this. Humus, which is organic matter, in the soil that's been properly prepared by microorganisms. The humus and microorganisms are the foundation of the soil. They produce plant nutrition. Healthy soil is necessary for healthy plants. Animals eat plants and animals eat each other. And the animals that are carnivorous usually eat plant-eating animals. Not a lot of carnivorous animals eat other carnivorous. So lions don't eat lions, right? Dogs don't eat dogs. Wolves don't eat wolves. Usually, carnivorous animals eat plant-eating animals. So, the plants are actually the foundation of the health of the animals, and human beings eat animals and plants. So, Sir Albert Howard said, the health of any living being in this chain of being is dependent on the previous links in the chain. So, man can only be as healthy as the animals and the plants, and the animals and the plants can only be as healthy as the soil. So it's very interesting for me because I lecture all over the world, literally worldwide. I, my wife and I make it around the world about twice a year. I don't know how many lectures I've given on health and nutrition in my life, but I've been lecturing professionally since 1988, almost nonstop. I've given thousands of lectures on these topics. And I have not yet met a single nutritionist that even knew the basics of soil science. Not even the basics. Okay, so here's a problem. What does it mean when you're prescribing vitamins and synthesized supplements, 90% of which, by the way, are manufactured by Hoffman LaRoche? 90% of the vitamins sold in this country are manufactured by a drug company and they're synthetic, which means they're processed in the body like a drug. They're not even real vitamins. Okay, so when you have people that are prescribing vitamin therapies without understanding the soil, which means you don't understand food, can you ever really cure a problem? No. And I can prove that to you. A simple experiment you can do. Go to your local pet sock store. Buy yourself a couple of rats, gerbils, mice, whatever you want. Buy four of them. Feed two of them whatever you're eating. 
feed the other two nothing but water and your favorite vitamins and see which one lives the longest. Now, if you don't want to kill the two rats eating the vitamins, I'll tell you what will happen. Within about a week, the ones on water and vitamins will die. And the ones eating your food will live about as long as you are going to live proportionately. And they'll probably die of the same disease you're going to die of based on your diet. But the reality of it is, vitamins are not food. They are catalysts that allow you to effectively metabolize food. A vitamin is only as good as the food you put in your mouth with it. Okay? So if you don't understand food, then you're using vitamins to fix junk food. And you can't make food better with vitamins. You understand that? Mm -hmm. Vitamins only allow you to metabolize what you eat with them. So if you're eating garbage, and you take vitamins, you just get more garbage in your body. If you're eating good food, it already has vitamins in it, so it's redundant. So now you're just wasting money. Okay? So, down to the dirt. Uh, I go to conferences with all these fancy high-caliber nutritionists, and I say, now let's just get down to the dirt here. Let's talk about what nutrition really is. So let's do it for a minute. In my book, uh, the first chapter is, If Einstein Were Your Doctor. And the reason I did that is because Einstein was a big picture man. Einstein wanted to know how God thought. He wanted to know how the whole universe worked. He wasn't interested in, in a, a supernova or in the solar system. He wanted to know how it all worked. So he was the big picture man in science. And, you know, he produced the general theory of relativity and the special theory of relativity. I don't know if you know much about Einstein, but he was a genius. And I wanted to apply Einstein's genius to healthcare. So I actually wrote a chapter where Einstein's doing a study where he's taking his principles of how he looks at the universe and applying them to medicine in a medical practice. So a patient shows up at the doctor, his doctor's not there, and Einstein walks in, and today Albert Einstein's his doctor. So Dr. Einstein sits there and goes through all the problems he's having and looks at all the drugs he's taking. And without telling the whole story, I'll let you read it, but you see what happens when Einstein becomes your doctor. So Dr. Einstein says, do you think you can really practice effective nutrition without knowledge of and management of the soil? The soil is the foundation, literally the ground substance of all that lives. So he says, let's take a look and you can decide for yourself. If you read the works of Rudolf Steiner, who is the founder of biodynamic farming, another genius, actually more than a genius, how many of you have read anything by Rudolf Steiner? Okay, not too many of you. Rudolf Steiner was about five geniuses trapped in one body, okay? Um, I won't go into Rudolf Steiner, but I've got about uh, 300 and last count, close to, what, what do I have? I think, no, about 175 Steiner books. I've read 18 of them cover to cover. If you've read any Steiner, you know it's not easy reading. <laughs> it's direct translations from his uh, native language, which is, uh, uh, what was it, um, Austrian. Austrian, yeah. And whoever did the translations did not change the syntax into English. So you're reading Austrian to English directly, so oftentimes the sentences are structured backwards and it's very hard mentally. But once you learn how to read Steiner and you can read them, it's like, wow. We need him right now, today. But he's smart, he won't come back because someone will kill him. <laughs> okay? So Steiner talked about superficial and deep digestion. He talked a lot about the earth as a living being. And he made correlations with the function of the earth and functions in your body. He talked about the soil and he said the soil has superficial and deep digestion. So the soil is the earth's stomach. Okay, the soil is the earth's stomach. And just like you have phases of digestion, the first phase of digestion is, well, if you want to be technical, it's choosing food that you can actually digest. So it's not using your mouth as a garbage can. That's step number one. The second phase is proper mastication. So you've got to chew your food properly. That's the f really the technically the first phase of digestion. Next is the stomach phase, then the small intestine phase, and then it, there's a few small changes in the colon, but the colon's sort of a staging area 
to get rid of things. In the earth, the topsoil is what Steiner refers to as superficial digestion and the earthworms are what Steiner refers to as deep digestion. So he talks about the earth's stomach has two layers, the microorganisms and the earthworms. Okay. Research shows that a gram of soil, now a penny, weighs a gram. Because so, it's often hard for people to put this into perspective. So when I say a gram of soil, I'm saying the same amount of soil by weight as one U.S. penny. So think about what I'm saying now. A gram of U.S. soil can contain 600 million microorganisms of tens of thousands of different species of bacteria and fungi. <coughs> so literally, you've got a city of living organisms in a thimble, a, so, a, a, a thimble, a sowing thimble of soil is about a gram of soil. So in there, you've got a population of about 600 million. And these little creatures are working to support the very food we eat and the very food and the very plant life that holds the whole surface of the earth together, literally. And controls the temperature on the planet. And regulates water flow on the planet. So these are critical things that very few people think about, which I will open up more to as we go along. So what you see here is the microorganisms such as fungal feeding nematodes, protozoa, predatory nematodes, bacteria, <coughs> others, there's an, th those are the main classes. You've got nematodes, trematodes, etc. They're all little, little guys. Some of these can get pretty big though, like you, you know the Ascaris worm, which is a parasite that infects the human being, frequently reaches 18 inches in length. Um, you can get tapeworms, which are uh, parasites, and they can be several feet long, many feet long. Now, humus, which is healthy topsoil with organic matter in it as nutrition for the microorganisms that live there, humus is very, very important because it holds water. One square foot of humus has been shown by research to hold seven gallons of water. So if you take a box, one foot deep, one foot wide, so one square foot, and fill it with proper humus, it'll hold seven gallons of water. This is critical because whenever the soil becomes deficient in organic matter, you get runoff. So the water actually runs off the soil. What do you think happens if water starts running off of farmland? What's it going to do to your topsoil? wash it away. So what happens is all your topsoil ends up in local creeks and local rivers and then it runs away. So you get what's technically called runoff. In a farming terminology, runoff means that you've got water running off the fields. Now we have a water shortage on the planet. If you read the, the journal The Ecologist, they predict as do many that the next world war is going to be fought over water and that there's going to be worldwide water shortages of major proportions by the year 2030 due to the population rise and the rate that we're using and polluting water. Now if you look at commercial farming and the amount of water that is being run off, if you just drive through places like El Centro and see the sprinkler systems going like crazy and know that these farms have very very low levels of humus so their water is actually just running off. It's wasting huge amounts of water, which is critical for everybody on the planet and every living thing on the planet. So you, when there's enough organic matter, it stops soil erosion and it improves the electromagnetism of the soil. A fantastic book, if you're interested in this, is Science in Agriculture by Arden Anderson. Arden Anderson references a lot of great Russian research and you can also look at the papers of William A. Albrecht and what the current research and recent research out of Russia shows in particular is that the microorganisms actually take the soil and convert it into a crumb-like structure. So if you take a graham cracker, certainly you've had the experience of crushing a graham cracker and then if you look at it they're actually little, almost like crystalline shaped structures. You understand what I mean by a crumb-like structure? So the microorganisms actually take the soil 
and using the organic matter and using their bodies, they reshape the soil into a crumb-like structure. This is what humus is. And the research from Russia showed that these little microorganisms create antennas out of the soil. So the way you have a satellite antenna on your house or on a hotel so you can get 500 channels, the little microorganisms are taking the soil and they're reshaping it into miniature cosmic antennas that suck starlight, moonlight, and sunlight right into the earth and turns the earth into a living battery. And the less microorganisms you have, the less conversion of soil into humus you have. If you don't have adequate humus, then the soil cannot accumulate enough energy. And what very few people realize is that plants grow along the electrical field created by the exchange between the sun and the earth. Water carries what's called a diamagnetic charge or a negative charge. Oxygen carries a paramagnetic charge and the sun is so powerful it splits photons into positive and negative monopoles. So a monopole is like a magnet with only one pole. Only the sun has the power in our solar system to split a photon into a monopole. That research was done and exposed by Philip Callahan, a, a famous researcher who has written several books on this topic and he was a scientist. So what Callahan showed is that certain rocks which are classified as paramagnetic will draw in the paramagnetic monopoles from the sun and water and soil and the fleshy bodies of the plants draw in the diamagnetic monopoles and when you put a positive and a negative together in a circuit you got work potential. Why this is important is because it is the electromagnetic health of the soil that generates a huge amount of our electromagnetic field that protects the earth from cosmic radiation and from stray bodies such as asteroids hitting the planet and the electrical field runs perpendicular to the magnetic field. So if you've ever seen a picture of the Earth's magnetic field, the Earth is on a 23 degree axis, the magnetic field wraps itself around the globe and the plants grow at a 90 degree angle to the magnetic field. Plants and trees grow exactly perpendicular to the magnetic field and the weaker the soil is, the less of a magnetic field there is and the less of a magnetic field there is, the less of a, an impulse to rise and become there is in the plants. Does that make sense? So as our soils die, the energy systems of the planet die. And since he's got to change tape, I'll conclude. You remember in Star Wars when they would tell Mr. Scotty to put up the shield, right? That took a lot of energy. Remember when the, when, the, when the ship was running out of energy? They couldn't put the shield up, which is scary, right? Someone can get you with a, some kind of famous weapon, you know? Zap you. Well, what concerns me is that our shields are down. Our soil is dying. We're running out of water. Our medical system's too busy selling you drugs and our chemical industry is too busy poisoning the soil to give a damn. And what we're doing is we've lowered the shield. And that leaves the door wide open for disease because your shield against disease is health. And you can't have health without nutrition and you can't have nutrition without soil. And you can't have soil that's healthy if you get too much ultraviolet radiation and if the earth starts getting beat up by asteroids and other bodies. So people are very ignorant to the importance of the soil. Two. We're getting into the good stuff. The stuff you need to know to stay alive. Okay. How many of you have ever been near a compost pile or have composted? Any of you? So you know as a compost pile matures, it gets hotter, doesn't it? So typically a compost pile reaches its peak at about 140, 142 degrees, okay? Why that happens is because you're actually witnessing the metabolism of the microorganisms. So just like you have a metabolism, when you start exercising, you get hot, and you have to sweat to cool your body down so it doesn't overheat. 
So when, when the microorganisms in the soil are metabolizing the organic matter in the soil, it actually creates heat. The microorganisms in the soil are very, very important, particularly in the places where the ground gets cold in the winter, because the metabolism of the microorganism keeps the soil from freezing too hard or too deep so that the roots of the plants don't die and so that the microorganisms in the soil don't die. The same way you wouldn't want to freeze to death, neither would the microorganisms. If there's not enough organic matter in the soil, then the microorganisms don't have anything to eat. If you don't fertilize the soils, then the microorganisms don't have enough to eat. So on farming fields that are open and don't have exposure to nature, which is not natural. You see, we didn't used to have farming fields. If you walk out in the woods, you see the grounds covered with organic matter. It's all the needles and leaves and plants that are going through their life cycle. The animals poop on the ground. The birds poop on the ground. The animals die and lay on the ground. So everything is recycled perpetually. So year round, there's always food for the microorganisms to maintain their metabolism and the research clearly shows that in the summer when the ground gets hot the microorganisms cool the ground by controlling water flow they regulate the water flow and the humus holds on to the water okay so if you don't have enough humus you can't hold water you can't cool the earth it's very very interesting with our greenhouse effect that we're experiencing because we've cut down so much of the natural foliage that the earth is literally overheating. It's, it's overheating. It's got an inflammatory process and you know how a human being if your temperature rises above 103 degrees your chances of dying get really good. This is what in a hospital what they'll do is they put you in a bathtub full of ice cubes to try to bring your temperature down so that you don't die. Well our planet has a fever. And the symptoms of inflammation in the human body are pain, heat, redness, and swelling. What's the most commonly prescribed medical drugs in the world? Anti-inflammatories. Now isn't it interesting? Human beings are a product of the earth. We are all an expression of the condition of the earth. It's hard to be healthier than the planet is, is it? Isn't it? How do you do that? Right? So the most commonly prescribed drugs in the world are anti-inflammatories because the earth itself is inflamed and because of the mismanagement of the earth, we're having a mismanagement of human beings. So if you keep taking drugs to lower your temperature and never look at what's causing the problem, you just die with a bunch of drugs in your body. Congratulations. So we've got to start paying attention to the fact that the earth itself is giving us a major indicator that it's in a diseased state. And if you can identify that, then you've just become the doctor, right? If you were a child and you were sick, who's the first one usually to identify that? Your mother. Usually your mother, sometimes your father, but it's usually your mother. Your mother says, come here, your cheeks are awful red. Oh boy, your forehead, honey, you're getting sick. It's time for you to, no, no more playing, we gotta calm you down your immune system needs energy, you're going to rest, right? And that's what mom does. Mom doesn't say, oh, you're getting hotter. Here, take an anti-inflammatory and get out there and mow the yard. <laughs> right? But that's exactly what the doctors do. And that's what the doctors do to the athletes that I work with all the time. It's worse than that. Here, take this shot. See, now your knee doesn't hurt. <laughs> you don't have any problem anymore. <laughs> Pretty cool, eh? <laughs> so, the microorganisms actually, if you look at the research, provide the majority of a plant's immune system. Most of a plant's immune system is provided for it by symbiotic microorganisms. The microorganisms are in a symbiotic relationship with the plants. Okay? So whenever you have a reduction in the microorganism population, you almost always see a reduction in the immunity of the plants. This was well demonstrated by Sir Albert Howard and Lady Eve Balfour with extensive research where they raised plants on different qualities of compost and they found that the poorer the quality of the compost and the less organic matter in the compost, the more easily the plants got diseases that were common to those plants. Okay, now there's lots more I could tell you, I just don't have time. So the, but there's many, many beneficial microorganisms. So you have what are called predatory fungi. So here's a picture right out of 
Lady Eve Balfour's book, the, 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 the Holly Experiment, it's called The Living Soil and the Holly Experiment is the longest ever run scientific experiment comparing organic farming to con con conventional farming and look at the studies of organic feeding on animals. They I'm sure they probably have several copies of the book in here, I would imagine. Uh, it was published, I believe, in 46. And it was a 21-year study on organic food and organic farming, and it showed hands down there was no comparison. I mean, over and over and over and over again, right? One of the images she shows here, here, this is an eel worm. And an eel worm, for example, is a common potato parasite. And the potato plant is what's called a mycorrhiza former. Okay, so uh, mycorrhiza means fungal filament. Myco, fungus, mycotoxin, fungal toxin, rhiza, runner, former, so it means that this type of fungus forms runners. Okay? And what these mycorrhiza formers do is they send their little filaments up the plant roots. So just like if a doctor wants to look at a man's prostate, he'll put a camera through the end of your penis and have a look inside of you or if they want to look in your bladder. So some, if you've ever had that done to you, fortunately I haven't, but many of my patients have told me interesting stories about that. Well, it's not quite so painful when the fungi do it. They actually are very, very powerful organisms. The funguses excrete extremely powerful acids that liquefy rock. So they actually take rocks and they use the acids of the fungus to convert it into liquid minerals and then they pump the minerals up into the plant and feed the liquid minerals to the plant. Here what you see is that they're also predatory fungi. So each plant that's symbiotic with its fungi, the funguses actually set up a defense mechanism in what's called the rhizosphere or the root space. Rhizosphere means root space. So in the root space of a plant, and 85% of all plants are mycorrhizoformers. That means 85% of all the plants that human beings can eat have friendly relationships with funguses in the soil. And the funguses actually loop their filaments. So there's a fungal filament. These are fungal filaments. There's a fungal filament there. And there you see uh, other parts of the fungus. And what it does is it loops itself. So you know what a, a little life preserver looks like at the swimming pool, right? And they throw it to you. Well, the fungus makes these little loops like that, and the funguses excrete extremely powerful adhesives, like tape, like glue. And so what they do is they leave these little loops all over, and the eel worms and the other predatory um, parasites that go after the plant have to get through this net that they create out of their filaments. So when the worm swims through, it gets stuck because there's glue adhesive on there. And then guess what? This is cool. It was worth reading this book just to find this out. Check this out. You see, there's the worm's nervous system and digestive system. Can you see that? There's just two tubes. Now come down here. Look at all the stuff in there now. What happened? See how many tubes there is in now? In that one? That's because when the fungus catches a predatory parasite that's going after its plant. Remember the acids that they use to melt rock? They attach to the body of the parasite. They burn a hole through it. And guess what they do? They eat the internal organs and they feed it to the plant. You know what's so cool about that? <laughs> Vegetarians have no idea. <laughs> that plants are highly carnivorous. <laughs> and this is a scientific fact. <laughs> and Sir Albert Howard and Lady Eve Balfour even tested the theory. They made vegetarian compost, and then they made three grades of compost. One with just animal hair, one with just blood droppings, and one with table scraps, like leftover steak bones and chicken and all that stuff. And then they raised plants on each grade of compost, and then they took barrels of the parasites known to attack those plants and covered the plants with parasites. And the plants that were raised on vegetarian 
compost had the highest rates of disease by far and the plants fed table scraps had almost no impact from the parasites at all. The parasite it was almost like they were invisible. The parasites didn't even touch them. They had about a 3% loss, which is what an excellent organic farmer gets anyhow. So what they showed bar none is that plants are highly carnivorous and love protein and they don't have mouths with teeth so the funguses do the eating and feed them and the funguses are smart they go after the organs why because in any animal that's where the nutrition's at the 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 what you know of as steak and all that stuff that's the poorest quality nutrition in any animal Weston Price showed you can make animals sick, but you can make lions sick by feeding them steak. You got to feed them organ meats, okay? So, what you see is that the funguses actually feed the plants the best of the animal nutrition available to them right out of the ground. And so, there's really no such thing as a vegetarian. That's just a bunch of baloney. Okay, and I have plenty of them that come to me as patients with diseases and I have about a 98% success rate of converting vegetarians back to meat eaters because I can explain it to them in a way they've never heard it done before and I've investigated the spiritual aspects of vegetarianism as well and I can chop suey that whole thing to death. <laughs> I'm a dangerous guy if you're a vegetarian. I'm, I'm like a samurai warrior waiting for you armed with facts. So if you go to my website paulcheck.com in the articles section there's two articles Vegetarianism Inside Out Part 1 and Part 2. Part 1 looks at the physiological aspects. What's the impact of a vegetarian diet on the human body physiologically? Part 2 looks at the spiritual aspects and I showed that every one of the commonly given arguments for vegetarian is absolutely incorrect even spiritually and I look at world religion and I break it down I'll let you read the articles if you're interested but I've gotten emails and calls from doctors all over the world that said those are the best articles I've ever read on vegetarianism and I use them in my practice all the time because you hit all the key points so it comes down to do you want to be healthy or do you want to die okay and the reality is if you die the funguses are going to eat you too. <laughs> so now you're just making meat for plants. Congratulations. <laughs> we'll feed you to a vegetarian. Okay. So these are critical factors here. Now these mycorrhiza form what are called vascular arbuscular mycorrhiza. These are the, these little filaments are technically called hyphae and these are the little uh, vascular arbuscular uh, they're, they're little nodules of nutrition and uh, here my friend Robert Farmer from the um, Tierra Miguel farm broke one open for us and actually it looks like blood in there if you squeeze it a liquid come out look just like human blood it's really wild and what they do in these mycorrhiza plants you see the filaments these are fungal hyphae filaments coming up the plant and they actually feed the plant so much nutrition it makes these little pouches of nutrition guess what those pouches of nutrition are there for in case of a famine in case in case we have a drought in case there's some sort of a plague in case something happens to the soil and the microorganisms get wiped out the plants store the nutrition and the funguses keep feeding them the nutrition so they can actually store it up and they have like a reserve just like you put money in the bank they put nutrition in the bank now what is the what does the funguses get out of all this so far we haven't discussed that what do you think the funguses get out of this deal guess what what's a fungus's favorite food and none of you have had a fungal infection? Sugar, right? So they drink the plant sap. So the plant produces enough sap to let the funguses drink as much sap as they need. And the funguses in turn feed them, literally feed them. And the bacteria do the same thing. The bacteria coat the roots of the plant. You ever pull the plant out of the ground and seen there's a slippery film, oftentimes a brown film on the roots? It's, you could actually get it on your fingers, it's slippery. That's bacteria. 
Those bacteria are part of the immune system of the plant. Okay? In a minute you'll see why this is so important. You probably think, Jesus, this guy's telling me everything about all the soil, but what about me? Well, this is about you. Okay? Now, research also shows that literally every enzyme, every hormone, and every vitamin in the human body can be found in the rhizosphere of most plants. Isn't that interesting? So if you go to a corn plant with sensitive enough testing instruments, you can find testosterone, estrogen, estradiol, estriol, you could probably find DHEA, cortisol. You can find literally every single hormone and every vitamin in the human body in the root space of plants. So if you look at enough plants, you'll find everything you need to manufacture in your body, provided that the microorganisms are healthy because they're the ones manufacturing the stuff. Okay? So what does that mean? Well, I'll show you what it means and I'll show you why I've given you this buildup of this basic soil knowledge. Hopefully by now you can see you can't really know much about nutrition if you don't understand the soil. Because what are you doing as a nutritionist? You're medicating people with vitamins and pills to compensate for what should come from the soil. How do we know that? Just track the statistics on disease backwards over time. We're, we're just laden with diseases we never had before. Okay. Research from Lady Eve Balfour's 21-year study showed that on any field that was farmed with chemical fertilizers, commercial fertilizers, there was an average of an 85% reduction in the microorganisms on that field. Okay, so everything I've just talked about, from water regulation to creating cosmic antennas to draw energy into the soil to produce the Earth's electromagnetic field to the manufacture of vitamins, minerals, enzymes, and steroid hormones and all these factors that, and I've only hit on some of them. I mean, there's, I've got volumes in my library just on what these microorganisms do. These are seriously intelligent little creatures. 85% reduction. Why? NPK fertilizers. They're all salts. What happens to a worm when you put salt on it? It kills it. If I put you in a solution with enough salt in it, it would kill you too. First thing that would happen is it would crack your skin right open and it would suck the water right out of you. Okay? So whenever you put chemical salts on the ground, it dehydrates the microorganisms and it kills them and it poisons them. Okay? So we only have on commercially farmed field on average about 15% of the microorganisms that control soil temperature, water regulation, vitamin production, mineral production, and provide a plant's immune system and feed the plant. So what it would be like if I said to you, okay, starting tomorrow, you're going to have an 85% reduction in all the factors that keep you healthy. And then I'm going to tell you that's the greatest thing that ever happened to farming. But I have to lie to you to do that. Okay? But I make lots of money while I'm doing it, don't forget. Okay? So what you see is any time you put herbicides, pesticides, fungicides, and rodenticides, and chemical fertilizers on the soil, you wipe out the earthworms and you wipe out the microorganisms on average to a tune of 85% which means that the plants have an 85% reduction in all the factors that are related to their health and vitality, which automatically means that anything that eats that plant has an equal reduction in its vitality. You don't need to be a genius to do that math. Okay? Now the government keeps telling us it's safe. In 1945, we put 200,000 pounds of chemicals on the soil in the United States of America. In the year 2002, we put two billion pounds. Now, the chemical manufacturers have infiltrated the agricultural schools the same way the drug manufacturers have infiltrated the medical schools. 60% of a medical doctor's education on average is provided for free by drug companies. And the chemical companies like Dow and Monsanto actually fund the agricultural departments and teach the farmers to farm chemically right in the universities and tell them that organic farming is a bunch of garbage. Okay? 
So what happens is now we have the government and even medical doctors telling us, oh, that the use of chemicals on the soils in such small doses, it's not going to harm you. Folks, I'll be as polite as I can. That's bullshit. <laughs> Let's just get clear here. That's absolute bullshit. And I can go show you study after study. Here's one from New Zealand. I chose this study for my lecture because it's from New Zealand, a country with far more strict health and farming standards than the United States by far. Okay? Now, I'll tell you about a study, another study in New Zealand in a minute. They, the scientists actually went to a New Zealand elementary school. They got in line with the school kids, with the tray, went right down just like the rest of the kids, and then they walked out the door got in their car and drove to the laboratory and analyzed the food. What did they find? They found 19 pesticides in that food and many of them had 10 times the safe limit for a week's consumption in one meal. Okay? This is in New Zealand. And when you look at what was in there and you look at the effects of this, many of these things are genetic disruptors. If you track this back and look at what the chemicals are actually doing to the human body, they disrupt the genetic functions in the body. So they disrupt hormonal production. They disrupt endocrine physiology. They disrupt the very key regulating systems. Where do you think these chemicals are coming from, by the way? Do you know where? Pesticides, so you've got herbicides, pesticides, rodenticides, and fungicides. Pesticides come in two primary classes, neurogenic okay, and estrogenic. So there's two primary classes. Both of them are exactly the same chemicals used in biological warfare, by the way. I'm an ex-82nd Airborne Division paratrooper. I know all about biological warfare and I've had many hours in a, in a biological warfare suit. It ain't fun stuff. Okay? Those two classes of chemicals, the neurogenic chemicals are designed to attack your nervous system and shut your nervous system down and the estrogenic chemicals do exactly to the bugs what the birth control pill does to women. They load the bugs up with estrogen which screws up their menstrual cycle so they cannot ovulate so because their life cycles are short, if you just wipe them out for a cycle, then the bugs all die off. You follow that? So you just keep spraying the fields and they can't reproduce. So it's just like um, men getting their testicles tied or a woman getting their tubes tied, so there's no more kids. Now if your life cycle was only 30 days or 14 days like a lot of the bugs, you could see the results of that really quick, right? So our children are being inundated with neurological and biological warfare chemicals in the name and under the disguise of plant chemicals that are supposed to protect you and your crops, which is absolute hogwash. Okay? Now what the argument is that the doctors give us and the government gives us, oh, that the doses are so small that it doesn't matter. That's garbage too. Okay? Here's the deal. And there's good research showing this. First of all, the doses that you're being given are based on some very, very false assumptions. So when they say, oh, lindane is safe in two parts per million, well, what happens when you're eating 